Hello, my name is Cliff Goodwin, and I welcome you here today for Preaching the Gospel. It doesn't matter whether you're tuning in via television or if you have logged on and have joined us over the internet, I am so grateful that you have taken this time out of your day to join me so that we might open the Word of God together and study more about God's Word. I have my Bible open today to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, and I would invite you to be finding verse 27 in your Bible at home or at work, wherever you find yourself presently. Philippians 1 and verse 27. I want us to study today about a lesson I've entitled, Worthy of the Gospel. Worthy of the Gospel. The Apostle Paul deals with this in Philippians chapter 1, and really he deals with it throughout the epistle to those brethren, but he does so in a way that is especially interesting when we appreciate some of the background regarding the city of Philippi and regarding the establishment of the church in that place. And so let's read our text, beginning at Philippians 1 and verse 27, and then we'll say more about some of those considerations. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in me. My, the manner in which chapter 1 draws to a close. Here in these four or so verses, we read about conflict. We read about adversaries. We read about striving together for the faith of the gospel. So many things that are pertinent factors in a discussion of a life worthy of the gospel. See, that comes to us from verse 27, though in the King James Version from which I'm reading today, it was not explicitly stated. The King James began at verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Becometh the gospel of Christ. That's an expression, and many of us, we know what that expression means. It's something that befits the gospel. It is becoming of the gospel in that it is befitting for the gospel or regarding the gospel. But many modern translations will read something to the effect, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. And that's really where we derive our title today. Your lives, my life, all of us as New Testament Christians, hopefully, we are to live our lives in a manner that could be described worthy of the gospel. Now, let me give you a little background regarding the city of Philippi, and I think it will really begin to help this pop, as it were, in our minds. We know historically that ancient Philippi was a Roman colony. That was important in the Roman Empire. Colonies were filled with Roman citizens. Oftentimes, perhaps, you would even have decorated veterans uh, of the Roman Empire who maybe would essentially retire to some of these colonies. And it's been said that these Roman colonies in the first century world they were basically little Romes in and of themselves. And so these places were very patriotic, typically. They were very devoted and very loyal to Rome and to the empire 
itself. Roman customs were honored and they were highly esteemed. And so that's important because this word conversation, as it appears in the King James Version of verse 27, it comes from a word which has to do with citizenship. Now, the people in and around Philippi, they would have known the importance of citizenship because this was a Roman colony. It was a city in which Roman ideals and Roman values and Roman law, all of those things were highly esteemed and valued. And so they, they knew the importance of citizenship as a Roman. Well, it's interesting that in talking about conduct, and I will freely admit that he's, he's dealing with conduct or behavior when he uses this word, but it's interesting that more often Paul would use a different Greek word. He, he would use a word that could be literally translated walk. In other words, walk worthy of your vocation wherewith you are called, Ephesians 4 and verse 1. Walking, of course, being a metaphor for life or conduct and behavior. And so why, when the apostle would usually use a term for walking, why here does he use a term for being a citizen and, obviously, conducting oneself appropriately as a citizen? Well, the only answer that I can propose is because of Philippi's status as a Roman colony. Now, for the general citizen in the city of Philippi, Roman citizenship would have meant so much. However, as Paul writes this epistle, he's not writing it to a general citizen of the city, is he? Not at all. He's writing this epistle to Christians, the saints who were in Philippi. Back up to chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to, he's writing this epistle, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So that's significant. Here when he discusses, or uses a word rather, that pertains to citizenship, it's not until chapter 3, perhaps, that we confirm his intention in using this term. Turn over with me to Philippians chapter 3 and notice verse 20. For our conversation. Now, in our English, King James Version, it's the same word. Conversation, 127. Conversation, 320. In the Greek, it's a different word than what is found in 127, but they share the same etymology. Etymologically, they are linked. It's this word for citizenship. And so substitute that word again in 320. For our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now get this. This is paramount to our study here today. As Paul wrote the Philippian epistle, he was writing to the saints. He was writing to the Christians, those in Christ, spiritually speaking, located physically in the city of Philippi. In writing this epistle, he is emphasizing to them that they are to live lives worthy of the gospel that they are to conduct themselves worthily as citizens, though not so much Roman citizens. That doesn't really matter, spiritually speaking. But they were to conduct themselves as heavenly citizens. 320 tells us their citizenship really is in heaven. And so right there in ancient Philippi of the first century, when you looked at the church of Christ in that city, you really beheld somewhat of a colony of heavenly citizens who were living and sojourning there in the city of Philippi. 
Now let's make the application. If you're tuned in or if you're viewing and you're a member of Christ's body, his church, you're a New Testament Christian. You're a part faithfully then of a local congregation. You need to realize that you and your brothers and sisters in that local church, that in a sense, you really are a colony of God's people there in your community. The local church is a body of heavenly citizens who are living and sojourning here on earth, yes, and particularly in that respective community. Now think, think about the responsibility. Think about the seriousness of having that status before God. No wonder then, no wonder then that Paul would say here in Philippians 1.27, live a life, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. What a responsibility you and I have as New Testament Christians, as members of the body of Christ, locally speaking, as Christians in our own communities. What a responsibility we have to live in such a way that we portray gospel ideals, that we adorn or make beautiful the doctrine of our Savior by the lives that we live. Whenever a child of God becomes worldly, half-hearted, unfaithful to Christ and to his teachings, they no longer adorn the doctrine of the Savior, borrowing that wording from Titus chapter 2, verses 7 through 10, that they no longer adorn or make to appear beautiful the teachings of our Lord, but instead they bring reproach. They bring shame on the Lord. They bring shame on his church, especially the local congregation of which he or she is a part. And so that's the very antithesis. That's the very opposite of what we're reading here in Philippians 1.27. We are to live lives worthy of the gospel. We've seen how that could have a special significance, a, a special punch, if you will, to the Christians in Philippi because of the nature of their city. It was a Roman colony, and they, they knew what citizenship meant as a Roman. Whether or not they possessed it, they no doubt had an idea of what it meant. But something they indeed possessed was heavenly citizenship as members of the church. And so because they can equate citizenship and they can understand its importance in various applications, the one that really matters is theirs. That The significance of their heavenly citizenship, chapter 3 and verse 20, they are to live in a worthy manner, conducting themselves in a worthy manner. Now, notice how this seems to be restated as we dig further into verse 27 of chapter 1. He says, let your conversation, your citizenship, your conduct, your manner of life, spiritually speaking, be as it becomes or is worthy of the gospel of Christ, that whether I come, he, he hoped to be released and to come to them in Philippi at some point, or else be absent. If I don't get to come or if I stay away, I can still hear of your affairs. And this is what he wants to hear. This seems to be somewhat of an equivalent to that statement at the beginning of the verse, let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel. Here's the equivalent. I want to hear that ye stand fast in one spirit. Stand fast. The Greek word, if, if we were to try to pronounce the Greek word, we would almost immediately recognize it as being similar to our word state. And I'm not talking about the meat that one might eat. I'm talking about a steak, a S-T-A-K-E, something that might be driven into the ground in, in order to provide solidarity, in or, order to provide a foothold, a stake. When he says there, stand fast, that Greek word would remind us of a stake, something that is, is permanent, something that is immovable. 
And so they're living a life worthy of the gospel. That could be stated differently as standing fast, persevering in the gospel, persisting in Christian ideals and in living the Christian life. And he says, stand fast in one spirit. And so also introduced here, and if time permits, I may say more about this, also introduced is the idea of unity. And that is something that seems to come up uh, in, in basically every chapter as one reads the book of Philippians. There's something stated in one way or another that gets back to Christian unity, being one, being in harmony with each other. And so this standing fast, this persevering and persisting in Christian faithfulness, it is to be in one spirit, in one harmony. We might even say, as it were, with one heart, with one heart. Now, the importance of this, again, is appreciated if we take the picture of a colony or perhaps even a city-state comprised of citizens in that city-state, how important is it that as a colony or city-state, those persons be united? That's very important. Because, see, in the next verse, we're introduced to adversaries. Notice verse 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. And so here the church is depicted somewhat as a colony. We might even think of it in our minds for the sake of illustration as a city-state comprised of citizens, and yet that city-state is confronted with adversaries. Now, whenever there are adversaries, verse 28, whenever there is conflict, verse 30, look look ahead. How important is it that these citizens be united, be in harmony? And, And so as we talk about worthy of the gospel, living a life that is worthy of the gospel, number one, I want us to say that unity as brethren is absolutely essential. Perhaps, I I don't know for sure necessarily, but perhaps there is nothing in which the devil delights more than in having brother pitted against brother, sister at odds with sister, and for there to be division, for there to be disunity in the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, to borrow from the words of James in James chapter 3, these things ought not so to be. It is absolutely essential in the local congregation. Let's keep it pertinent to the local church, which is really the case here with Philippi in this epistle. It is absolutely essential in the local congregation that I love and that I get along with my brethren. Now, I know human personalities are so different from one person to the next, and so naturally there might be some with with certain personalities that I'm just not as inclined toward as I would be others, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, it has to be said that we're unified, that we love the same Lord, we're practicing the same faith, we're pressing toward the same goal, and that none of our differences regarding personality, none of those things are going to get in the way of our Christianity, are going to get in the way of our living a life that is worthy of the gospel. And so in the next chapter, if you move ahead into chapter 2, the Apostle Paul, he revisits almost immediately after talking about one spirit and one mind and striving together all of those statements in 127, almost immediately as we come into chapter 2, he revisits that idea of unity. He gives us a prescription for unity. Verse 2, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, 
having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Notice how he just keeps punching that. He keeps driving that home. I want you to be like-minded. I want you to have the same love. I want you to be of one accord. I want you to have one mind. All of that in 2-2. Two, two. Now notice 2-3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. First of all, if we want unity, we've got to clean up our motives. We cannot have a contentious streak in our hearts. We cannot do things simply to stir up strife or simply to bring or garner vain glory to ourselves, drawing attention to ourselves. No. He says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Friends and brethren, this is the divine prescription for unity among God's people. We've got to put the other first. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. That, that goes against our nature, so to speak, as people, it appears. But, but this is the biblical instruction. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, his own interests. Don't be self-absorbed, self-centered, and self-seeking, self-serving. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind, this very mindset he's described in verses 3 and 4 is the mindset of Jesus Christ. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. A life worthy of the gospel is a life of Christian unity among our brethren. Okay, Number two. A life worthy of the gospel is a life that earnestly contends for the faith. Now, some of you recognize that I've stepped outside of Philippians to borrow that expression, right? Jude, verse 3, tells us that we should earnestly contend for the faith. Now, that word earnestly, that's particular to contending uh, there in Jude verse 3. But here in Philippians 1 and verse 27, the idea of striving is from the same Greek word. Here, striving together comes out explicitly. Striving together. We've already touched on unity. So now let's touch on the striving part or the contending part. You know, in verse 28, we read about the adversary. Another term for adversary is enemy. And thus, when you put 27 with 28, the meaning is, is unmistakable. We're striving together. We're earnestly contending for the faith of the gospel, the, the, the teachings of Christ, all that Christianity is and espouses and upholds and promotes. We're striving together to promote Christ and to promote his church, to promote his gospel. We're striving together, but that's because there are enemies. You know, I suppose if there were no enemies, there would be no contention. If there were no adversaries, there would be no need to strive together, I suppose. But what do we know about these enemies? Well, it's interesting. It's interesting. We can stay in Philippians initially. We turn over to Philippians chapter 3, and we read about some such enemies of the cross. For many walk, I'm at verse 18, Philippians 3, 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, Paul says. I, it breaks my heart, but I have to tell you that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, their self-serving, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. My, what a description of the adversaries. We can go to another Pauline writing, another Pauline passage. Turn over with me to Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, we read categorically, we read, rather broadly or generically, what all enemies of the cross, all enemies of the Christ, what they are doing or seeking to do 
In Romans chapter 1, notice verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, the King James Version reads, hold the truth. But the the point, the meaning of the Greek text is they hold down the truth in unrighteousness. That's why some versions might read, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, first of all, in the context of ancient Philippi, you had a body of Christians. You had the church of Christ there in the city of Philippi. Yes, a city known for Roman citizenship, but there within that city were a body of souls known for their heavenly citizenship. And yet there were adversaries. From the very beginnings of the church, if you go back to Acts chapter 16, when and where the church began in Philippi, there were adversaries from the beginning. They opposed truth. They wanted to suppress and hold down truth. Paul tells these Philippians, you strive together, you earnestly contend for truth. You strive together for the faith of the gospel because there are adversaries. We've got to keep preaching. We've got to keep practicing, and not really in that order, right? We need to keep practicing the profession of our faith in Christ. We've got to keep preaching the doctrine of Christ. That is involved in a life that is worthy of the gospel. Be unified and earnestly contend for the faith. Thank you so much. Do you desire to be a citizen in Christ's kingdom? I'm so thankful for your obvious interest in spiritual things or else you would not have joined me here today for preaching the gospel. May I encourage you now lovingly and and respectfully, why not make plans for this coming Sunday? Make plans for yourself, for your family. Seek out and find the church of Christ in your community and visit this coming Lord's Day. I trust you'll find a warm and inviting welcome. God bless.